Thank you very much, Bill. I, I, uh, I like the perspective, and then we need to have a conversation about that. And what Bill Fletcher just said, we may not agree, but we have the same reality with Venezuela. Uh, over there, they have the institution, but Chavez is gone. And then, of course, uh, you know, they are about to kill the revolution in Venezuela. So that's the next perspective that we can discuss about. Nadia from Enso Coalition. Thank you. That's very interesting. Um, I want to thank the committee for inviting me to celebrate mm -hmm. and honor the legacy of Thomas Sankara. Um, I, I, I'm learning about Thomas Sankara, and um, he is an inspiration to me, a great revolutionary leader who I believe is, continues to inspire millions and millions of people um, on every continent. I'm an activist with the Answer Coalition, and um, I'm also a doctor, and I work with undocumented um, and uninsured patients in Maryland. So my comments are focused um, more on reflections that I have about Thomas Sankara from my perspective as a socialist and as a doctor. And the two are really intertwined. Um, so uh, maybe, you know, I'm, maybe I'm, uh, I agree, I agreed with many of the comments. I thought your talk was fascinating. May, I think I'm a little bit more of a revolutionary optimist. Um, I, I think that, you know, it, you can, you can kill a revolutionary, but I do believe that the struggle and Thomas Sankara's aspiration, um, continues in the people, um, and even the young people who maybe never met him, but it's very much present, um, and that wherever there's exploitation and oppression at some point, there will be a resurgence. It may take a while, and it is a process. Um, I think we're s seeing this example in Burkina Faso. I'm not an expert, um, and and all over the African continent. Despite the setback and his murder, um, the people of Burkina Faso, like all oppressed people, find a way to continue the revolution because it really isn't driven by one man or one woman, but the aspirations, the dreams of a people to live, to have a better life. Thomas Sankara's ideas and his, so, his as a socialist example remains a source of great inspiration for many and for me personally as a physician. And uh, I, I'm amazed at how much he accomplished in the area of public health and social well-being in such a short amount of time. It is mind-boggling. Against all odds, in one of the most oppressed countries, he did so much in four or five years. And then as it happens to so many leaders like him, he was murdered. He was focused on improving the health and well-being of the Burkinabe, his people. He did this in a country where the average life expectancy was 42 and illiteracy was as high as 98%. Before the revolution of 1983, there was one doctor for every 50,000 people. Hundreds and maybe thousands of people were trained after the revolution to serve as public health workers. And many of you probably know all of this history, but it's still worth repeating. They vaccinated millions of children against meningitis and polio and instituted mass sporting events like bicycling to keep people healthy. And environmental issues were addressed in a real way. I, am st I still am amazed two million trees were planted to deter the degradation of the environment, a really extraordinary task. People in every village were encouraged to plant trees and get down on their hands and knees, and they did it because they believed in the revolution. And this is a model that the WHO continues to cite. Literacy was decreased by half, and medical care was 
for the first time provided in rural areas. But of course, there were mistakes made. Uh, there were elements within the society, those with privileges. The privileges were decreased and they were unhappy. Sankara got rid of the concept of the chief over the farmer and he set up a more equitable distribution of land. And more than most revolutionaries, he addressed sexism in a, in a direct and head-on way and in a very courageous way. In the workplace and in the home, he constantly pushed for women to take the lead and provide daycare and centers and cafeterias so that women could reach their revolutionary potential and their personal potential. And he advocated that men do equal share of the housework. Sankara understood the interconnectivity between illiteracy, low education, environmental destruction, and poor health. And as a doctor, and many of us already know, that nothing impacts a person's health more than not being able to read and not knowing, uh, and not having a place to live. Thomas Sankara had complete confidence in the rev revolutionary potential of human beings. I have learned a lot from him. He explained things to people with compassion and clarity from a socialist perspective so that people had a deeper understanding about why they are hungry or unemployed. And he gave people the means and the confidence to fight back. He said, those who feed you control you. That was his explanation of imperialism. And he gave people a sense that they could accomplish the seemingly impossible. Women volunteered by the thousands and got on their hands and knees to create a railway system that would otherwise have been impossible without technology. He applied socialist methods as had been done in Cuba and China before him. That is, he broke down the divisions and the hierarchy between the experts and the non-experts, and he allowed for the training of people who had never had any opportunities before. Thousands of healthcare workers were trained to serve the public. For the first time, health care was provided in rural areas. This is reminiscent of what the Cubans accomplished after the social revolution. In Cuba, the TB epidemic was eradicated because socialism allowed for a new paradigm, one based on people's health rather than profits. Because profit was no longer an incentive, great things all of a sudden become possible under socialism universal health care becomes possible. In Cuba, nurses and doctors were paired in specific neighborhoods to ensure patient-centered continuity. Sankara wanted to follow the example of Cuba. The WHO still points to Cuba and also China as the two countries that most dramatically impacted public health in the shortest period of time. It happened because the profit motive was removed from the equation. In China, in the short span of 15 years after the revolution, smallpox and cholera were completely eradicated, and the problem of opium, opium addiction was tackled. The Barefoot Doctor was created, probably one of the most effective public health strategies of all time. Life expectancy doubled in China during the early years of the revolution. And all of this was possible because the success of the system was not measured based on profits or cost containment, but on the social health and well-being of people. Thomas Sankara is an inspiration to me. As a doctor, I am continually told by management that the bottom line must be sustainable. But sustainable by whom and for whom and for what purpose? These are really code words under capitalism for market-driven systems that need profit margins to be viable. But why is this? Why should the health of a human being be based on market forces and profit margins? 
What about the sustainability of a person's mental health or emotional health or their ability to live, live happily and disease-free? I think about Tom Sankara frequently as I see my patients. I think about what he represents. I think about his idealism and his candor and his enthusiasm. I think about his complete commitment to a new society, a socialist society, not a piecemeal mishmash that will be usurped in the end. I think about his non-negotiable stance towards corruption and opportunism and sexism and the need to put people before profit. As a doctor, I witness every day the ravages of the criminal capitalist healthcare system, and I think it doesn't have to be like this. I think of my patients who are dying slowly and predictably because of a lack of insurance sorry, or money to buy prescription drugs. I think of my patient who had a severe stroke because she couldn't afford the astronomical price of blood pressure medications. She can't speak anymore or even tell me what is wrong. Her husband can't get the services to care for her at home because home care is not covered by her insurance. We talk together, as Sankara would do, with people he met intimately and with compassion and with love. The, her husband is the first to point out that the capitalist system is what killed his wife, is killing his wife. He knows this, I don't have to tell him this. Sankara's example is a bright light and a clear vision for us to follow. At this event today, we look back, we look at the mistakes, but we also look forward to take the lessons we learned from history and apply them to today. And it's our job as we keep Sankara close to our heart and spirit to continue the struggle in a revolutionary, enthusiastic, and committed way and to always share, learn from, and encourage others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. Omar Musa. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Uh, I wanted to um, begin explaining, and uh, some of you I remember last year, sitting in this room, we were celebrating the overthrow uh, of Campari. Um, we were very happy and pleased. Uh, and we noted that it was the action of hundreds of thousands of Burkinabi, regular Burkinabi, who made it possible for, to get rid of Campari regular people, led by the youth of the country. So here we are a little over a year later in this same room to discuss where do we go from here. It's interesting that there is a common theme from last year and this year. The reemergence again of the thought and ideas and political practice of Thomas Sankara. Now, I'm going to pick a bone here. Uh, maybe people won't like it. Uh, that's your right. He's often, Sankara is often referred to as the Che Guevara of Africa. In my opinion, he stands outside of that. He's neither better nor worse. He is, as a matter of fact, a brother in struggle of Che Guevara. But he's not the African version of Che Guevara. You never hear anybody say, um, you know, uh, Engels is this, that, or the other of Karl Marx, or Lenin this, that, or the other, or Raoul is this, that, or the other of Fidel. So I wanted to pick that bone and get it off my chest because it's been on my chest for a while. The theme of this meeting is the legacy of Sankara, what it means today. And we have to look at the world we live in today. We live in a world of grinding, economic depression and crisis for the overwhelming majority of people, no matter where you live, whether you live in Burkina Faso or Washington, D.C. That is our reality as workers. That's the framework. We live in the framework of genocidal wars, Syria, Iraq. We live in a world where yesterday, 
there was a vote, right, on whether or not a longtime office holder in Central Africa could extend his term for 17 more years. And this is what happened with Paul Kagame in Burundi. Rwanda, I'm sorry. Yeah. The head of president of the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Togo, other countries, leaders, so-called, have floated the same kind of thing. This is part of the world that we live in. They never steal enough, they never oppress enough, and they want to extend it. Wasn't this the beginning of the downfall of Kampaori? It wasn't that for seven, 27 years he was a good politician. During the course of his regime, he wiped away all of the gains that other speakers have spoken about previously. And he had to be chased out, not through elections. He had to be chased out by the mobilization of hundreds of thousands of people, Birkenau and told he couldn't come back. My brother here says uh, he should be put on trial. Last year he said this. Uh, I, I wholeheartedly endorse that. What we've seen in the last year is something else, Burkina Faso. What we've seen is bourgeois forces, wings of the army, the presidential guard, all masquerading as the savior of the people of, the, of Burka, Burkina Faso a coup, a short coup, by the head of the presidential guard at the time. That was thwarted. By whom? Not the African Union, not France, and not the United States. It was thwarted because the masses went into the street again. There's a profound lesson in why I keep saying that. The French and the United States government backed the African Union to stabilize the situation. That is what they are for, stabilizing the situation. It doesn't matter the situation confronted by the 18, 19 million Burkinabi people. Now, the elections that happened on the 29th of November could only happen because the masses actually went into action. Think about that for a while. Not, be, not who they supported in the election, not who they supported, not who they voted for, but through the actions that they carried out that stopped any other attempt to close down the political space that they had won and fought for, to discuss which way forward for the Burkinabi people. I, I looked at the uh, candidates, um, including the winner, who has claimed won 53% of the vote. Kabori. He was a prime minister, was he not? <laughs> okay. Then the person who got the second largest number of votes, Diabre, you have to help me with the names. Diabre. Yeah. Wasn't he an official in the same government? <laughs> now, there was one fellow who didn't, they don't talk about too much. His name was Sankara, and they explained that he wasn't a relative. I don't know what his program was. Many of you probably know more than that, than I do. But one thing we have to keep in mind always, and that is the action of the Burkinabi people are the decisive ones. That is really the lesson that Thomas Sankara taught. I agree with Brother Fletcher here that there was no uh, political instrument, a revolutionary political instrument, a Leninist type party, a July 26th movement that could move the Burkinabi revolution forward in 1983, 4, 5, and 6, and 7. That's true. But other things were going on underneath the surface. And this is what I think sparked the popular interest once again in Thomas Sankara. He believed that mass organizations had to be created at the grassroots, and they were to take responsibility for everything from the anti-bureaucracy drive, anti-corruption drive, to organizing 
men and women to fight in the interests of women and the whole society. Nobody else could do it. Nobody else could do it. The interest will continue in his ideas. Uh, Bill made a point that um, Thomas Sankara never said, I'm a communist. OK, but that's what he was. That's what he was. And he looked at everything in the country and the world from the perspective of the international and local class struggle. How do you unify the different nationalities that exist, language groups that exist? and Burkina Faso. You begin from what is in the interest of them all and begin to educate and organize from there. Why was he a supporter of the Cuban Revolution? He made some comments. Way over there is this country called Cuba from Burkina Faso because of the example. You know, in 1959 and 1960, Fidel Castro didn't say, I'm a communist. But people in the United States government thought he was a communist and acted accordingly by organizing plans to overthrow the government, of, the revolutionary government in Cuba. When they did declare that, Fidel, to over a million Cubans in the street of Havana, there was overwhelming support for this, and still is. So that's not a deal, whether he claimed this or that. But his actions pointed to the interests of the working class, the working masses, and he had many enemies. His enemies included, of course, the metropolitan France, the hangers-on in places like Togo, Côte d'Ivoire, that helped organize the thing, a little short war with the government of Mali. These were the enemies, not just of Thomas Sankara, but what the Burkinabi people were accomplishing and doing. That is what is frightening and scary to every dictator in the world. The mobilization of millions of people to fight in their own interests. This is the most important thing, I think, of Thomas Sankara's ideas. Now, the generation that's on the scene now, he, well, let me just go back and take a step. Sankara is for organizing everybody to fight in their interests. He said, you know, you got good old guys, elders, and bad elders. So let's organize the good elders to fight the bad elders. Same with everything else. Let's take the land out of the hand of the money grubbers and put it in the hands of the toilers. And he did so. He organized to do so. Some of the most archaic practices against women were the case in Burkina Faso. He organized and he said to the, to the women of the country, you have to fight and organize to demand your rights as a human being. And if you do that and as you do that, revolutionaries will be with you. There's a speech in the book uh, that Bill referred to here. I think it's the best book ever if you want to get an idea of what this guy, Thomas Sankara, was about. In this, uh, what's called the uh, political orientation speech, he offers a guide for us to really understand where he was going. In this speech, he explains concretely the class structure of the country that he lived in, the role of each layer and section of the different classes in society, the role of the local servants of the French bourgeoisie, Burkinabe exploiters, the layers of military, so-called military leaders and others who are arrayed against the interests of the workers, peasants, and youth. I urge you to get a copy of it. Let me just read a little bit. Uh, I know I'm probably taking a long time, and my brother here is going to put the hook on me shortly, but let me read this. He describes the revolution. He says, the Burkinabi revolution was made by the Volta, they were called the uh, Upper Volta then, popular masses themselves, with their own slogans and aspirations. The goal of this revolution consists of having people assume power. That is the reason why the first act of the revolution, 
following the August 4th proclamation instituted in the new government was the appeal addressed to the people to create committees for the defense of the revolution. That is empowering. And as